Once upon a time, there was a monk called Herman the Recluse, who was condemned to death for breaking his monastic vows. His sentence? Being walled up alive, left to starve. As the bricks were going up, he begged for his life. Upon hearing the impossibility of his suggestion, the abbot allowed for one last chance of atonement. Herman must write down all of humanity's knowledge overnight. Frantically, he starts writing, but the midnight toll proves little hope of success. In desperation, he prays to Lucifer for help. By the morning, the manuscript was complete. The devil had guided his hand, saving his life, only asking for one thing in return. His portrait must be featured in the Codex in a grandiose way, keeping readers and viewers forever questioning the true purpose of this manuscript. Hello everybody and welcome to In the Flesh, a video series that I've been wanting to start for a while where we take a deep dive exploration, have a learning session about medieval manuscripts that I find very, very interesting and hopefully you will too. I already have a list of about the first five or six <laughs> that I want to explore, but we have to start somewhere and that is the absolutely fascinating, mysterious Codex Gigas, also known as the Devil's Bible. The conception of this particular manuscript is quite unknown, as you may have noticed with the first minute of this video. The only two details that we really know for sure about when it was originally written is that it was sometime between 1204 and 1230 and that it was in the Kingdom of Bohemia, currently Czech Republic. Aside from these two details, we don't factually know where or in which monastery it was written, but we have two clues to assume that it was a Benedictine monastery. First of all, there are 10 pages that are currently missing from the Codex Gigas and that is believed to have been the rules of St. Benedict but I will put that in a, you know, quick packet and put it in my pocket and save it for later. The other clue that we have is the first known monastery that had this manuscript in their possession, and that is the Podlachice Monastery. Please tell me how to pronounce that. Please. I tried looking it up. That's the best I could do. Same goes for the rest of the Czech terms that, I, uh, that are coming soon, shortly. The main reason why it is not believed that the codex was written in this monastery is because it was a bit too small, too poor, honestly, to be able to take on such a massive project. It's not just the labor that you're putting in there, but more importantly in terms of cost is the vellum, the parchment, the ink, everything that goes into it, the paint, everything has to be paid for and it is very unlikely that this particular monastery would have had the means to pay for such a ginormous book. In fact, the reason why this monastery had to sell it was to avoid bankruptcy. This particular event happened in 1295 when it was sold to the Sedlets Monastery. It also did not stay here very long. It was later purchased by the Benedictine Order in the Vjevnov Monastery. By this point, the book was famous already. People knew about it, people wanted to see it, people wanted to look at it, especially because, as you saw from the thumbnail, it has a massive image of the devil. This is not, was not a normal thing, especially in a book that includes the Bible. We will talk a bit more about the texts that are included, but it was a mix of important religious and secular books, all in one codex. In 1594, Emperor Rudolf II wanted it, and he took it on loan and of course never gave it back. Rudolf II was notorious for being fascinated with the occult. He actually had multiple collections of weird oddities, so he kept the Codex Gigas until 1648. This was right at the end of the Thirty Years' War when the Swedish army took it along with many other things into the Stockholm Palace. It remained here under the rule of Queen Christina and beyond, including going through a fire. Yes, in 1697, the palace caught on fire, and as the flames were going on, the librarians of the palace started throwing books out of the window in order to save them from the fire. Thankfully, Codex Gigas was one of them, even though it is ginormous. Supposedly, allegedly, according to a witness that wrote about this 50 years later, 
the codex fail on top of an actual person injuring them, maybe killing them, you would assume that a book that weighs 165 pounds would kill someone, but we don't know. It saved the book though <laughs> until 1878, when it was transferred to the, at the time, new National Library of Sweden. This is still the place where it is kept, and that is the end of the overall timeline of what the Codex Gigas has gone through. Now let's talk a bit about the actual details specs of the book. Like I mentioned earlier, it is 165 pounds. It has 310 parchment leaves, which makes for 620 pages. Also, let's keep in mind that originally it had 10 more that have been lost. We don't know when they were lost, by the way. Some people think that maybe they were lost when it was dropped out the window in a fire, but that is highly unlikely, actually. It was probably lost before it got to the palace. The book measures 35 inches high and 19 inches wide with a thickness of 8.7, almost 9 inches. That's a lot. That's a very big book. It takes at least two people to move that thing and pretty much two people to open. And once it's open, I think one person can move the pages, but then you risk damaging them. So it's better if you have one person in one end, one person in the other. It's a team effort. It's like those IKEA furniture instructions that tell you it takes two people, but no, because you live alone. So you actually build it by yourself. Don't do that with this book. You're going to ruin it. And it's 800 years old. Get your friend wait for your friend, then open the book. But you can't, because it's in a glass case in the National Library of Sweden, so never mind. Continuing with the details of the book, the binding of the Codex Gigas is made of wooden boards, and it is believed that the wooden boards that are currently in the Codex are the original ones. However, the leather has been replaced at some point. It currently is bound with white leather. It looks stunning. Here's a picture. And the corners are protected with beautiful metal fittings. The actual vellum used for the pages is made of calfskin, and the calligraphy is made in Carolingian minuscule, which may or may not be the next calligraphy tutorial that we do on this channel. I am very excited for that. Oh, and one thing I haven't mentioned, Codes Gigas literally means giant book. It's, it's very accurately named as the absolute biggest medieval manuscript that we have in existence. Now let's get into what are the actual contents of this book, because that is one of the most fascinating parts about this. There are a few, but this is definitely one of them, because it is a really curious and unique combination of religious text from multiple religions and also secular texts all combined into one ginormous massive book and it's impossible to not question why why would someone put this all in one single book because you would the first assumption is well maybe it is because he was hoping for some sense of uh, facilitating the, the reader so that you have all the information you need in one single book but then you have a book that takes two people to open <laughs> or to move. So that doesn't necessarily make it easier or accessible for someone to just, oh, let me just, you know, grab my favorite book and read everything I need to know about the entire human knowledge in one sitting. That's not going to happen when the book potentially weighs as much as you do. But rumbling and speculation aside, the book starts, the first half of the book, is the Old and the New Testament of the Bible. This part includes some beautiful initials, actually four out of the six full page illuminated capitals that are in the book are belonging to each one of the four evangelists. Then we move on to the Jewish history section. This part includes texts written by Josephus Flavius. The first one, Antiquities of the Jews, is an early Jewish history up until 66 AD. And then the Jewish War is about their rebellion against the Romans from 66 to 70 AD. The third section of the Codex Gigas was Etymology, written by Bishop Isidorus of Seville. It was written from 560 to 636 AD, 
and it was the most popular and the standard encyclopedia during the Middle Ages. So when you're writing a book that is supposed to include all of human knowledge, an encyclopedia feels like the perfect place to start the secular section of said book. Etymology is essentially an entire compendium of the knowledge that people had at the time. It had all sorts of topics, from grammar to legal science to geometry, sociology, philosophy, even clothing. So basically everything that people were thinking about and exploring at the time was included in this encyclopedia. The fourth section of the codex is the medicine section. It was a compendium of medicinal works that were essentially the medicinal standard at the time. It included two books, The Art of Medicine and Aphorisms of Hippocrates. The Art of Medicine, or Ars Medicinae, established medicine as a science and even included texts on diagnostics. The National Library of Sweden website provides us with a beautiful, beautiful quote from Aphorisms of Hippocrates, which reads, Life is short, art is long opportunity fleeting, experience deceptive, judgment difficult." Close quotes. Fair, yeah, still rings very true today. The fifth section of the Codex focused on Czech history with the Chronicle of Bohemians, written by Cosmas of Prague from 1119 to 1125. And the sixth and last main long section of the book was the rule of St. Benedict, written in 516 AD by Benedict of Nursia. After these major sections of Codex Gigas, we go on to the minor shorter texts that were also included in the book, starting with a five page long list of confessions. And this is clearly one of the sections that inspired the myth that I shared with you in the beginning of the video. Because it is an extensive list of sins that essentially sounds like the scribe who wrote it was confessing directly to this page, maybe as a form of atonement, maybe as a form of penance. Ironically, and I assume very purposefully, these are located directly before a full page illustration of heaven the kingdom of heaven or the heavenly city of Jerusalem. A partial and certainly non-exhaustive list of these sins include pride, envy, gluttony, lust, fornication, and bestiality. No wonder people just assume he was being condemned to death. These five pages of confessions end with a prayer for forgiveness and mercy. And now, of course, we have to talk about the most popular spread of the Codex Gigas, which is where we have on the left side the image of heaven and on the right side the image of the devil. No text, no nothing, no explanation just heaven and hell. The heaven side has always been seen as the city of God, and as one would think of heaven, it is meant to represent hope and salvation. While next to it, not only is the devil taking over the entire page, but the way he is represented is very telling as to what the illustrator was trying to convey. The devil in this image is wearing an ermine cloth which was a fabric reserved for those of royalty. So having the devil wear an ermine cloth essentially puts him in a royalty position, accepting the devil as the prince of darkness. Is it just talking about hell or is it just really hot today? This spread is by far the most popular and recognizable element of the Codex Gigas. And this has always been the case, and we know this because the vellum on these two pages is way more tanned than the rest. And no, it is not because the devil put some sort of spell in the book and the shadows are creeping through the pages and the flesh. It's just because of light pollution, <laughs> that's all it is. The vellum being darker in the spread indicates the absolute fascination that humans have had with the occult. For 800 years, this is the one spread that stays open. This is the one spread that people keep going and keep looking at. And, and we cannot say that it was just because it's sitting open like that in a museum, because museums have glass cases that protect the books from UV light. So it is safe to assume that this has not happened in a museum. 
this happened before. This happened before I got to the museum. This happened when this book was sitting in a library for anyone to grab and look through, and everybody would grab it and look at the devil. The second section of the shorter texts are a brief list of spells and magic formulas. The spells include cures to sickness and illness, this includes exorcism, and the magic formulas were rituals for larceny or capturing thieves. The National Library of Sweden, once again coming through for us, giving us one of the spells. Blood you drink, and meat you eat, and in blood you are washed. But collect 150 claws and lie down in a place like a yearling lamb. Sleep now, and forever and ever. Amen. Medieval rituals are just the best. I hold it against me. Please remind me if I haven't done this within a year. Tell me why haven't you done this? We need to make a video on some spells and recipes and extra weird stuff. Yeah. Moving on with the short texts, the third part is a calendar and mainly focuses on saints celebration days. And aside from this calendar, the only additional thing we have is obituaries. A lot of them. 1539 of them to be exact. The codex was entirely written in Latin and it also has over 50 marginal notes from everyone that has acquired it. That is actually a big reason why we have a really good idea of its timeline and where it has been throughout the past 800 years. On to the topic that I find the most interesting part about the Codex Gigas, and that is the scribe. Because we don't know who it is. The first minute of this video, and my personal favorite part, is a myth. We don't know that. And that myth started because of one name that shows up towards the end of the Codex, which is Herman Inclusus. Not only is this the largest medieval manuscript in existence, but paleographers and historians agree that it was made by one single person. This was not the norm at all. The norm was the scribes would work together in a Bible, in a book, in whatever they were working on. It would be multiple scribes, and on top of that, it would be someone else illuminating it and illustrating it. The Codex Gigas shows that it was all done by a single person. And another good reason as to why the myth of the pact with the devil became so popular and almost accepted as reality is because the penmanship is abnormally consistent. Let's say it took this one single scribe 20 to 30 years to create this entire book, which is what is likely, considering that he had to rule the pages, do the entire calligraphy, and also do all of the illustrations and illuminations. And on top of that, if he was a monk, which it's safe to assume that he was, he also had his duties to the monastery to take care of. So it could not have taken less than 20 to 30 years when you take all of this into account to write this, which essentially is a lifetime, assuming that he didn't start writing this until possibly his 20s. Add 20 to 30 years to that, and that's an average medieval lifespan. But also, let's take into account that later in life, your eyesight deteriorates, your coordination deteriorates. The fact that the penmanship is so consistent throughout the entire 620 pages of this manuscript shows that essentially this person took their entire life, prime years, into writing this book. That is already a feat. That is already something incredible. Like with anything that you do with your life for 20 to 30 years, it is bound to change. It usually changes. So the sheer consistency of this, it is, is the most incredible thing. And no wonder it makes people believe in stories of the devil. And aside from the consistency of the penmanship, Probably the one other clue that is the most telling of this being a single scribe is looking at the diversions that he took from the standard of the Carolingian Minuscule Calligraphy. The National Geographic made a 45-minute documentary on the Codex Gigas, but one of the collaborators in this documentary pointed out the very unique G's in the calligraphy. Everything else in terms of the alphabet is goes along with the Carolingian minuscule standards, but for some reason the letter G was diverted from that. And it is the same G, it is written the exact same throughout the entire manuscript. Again, this can be applied to what you or what I could be doing with our calligraphy. 
If you've watched any of my calligraphy tutorials, I always mention that I have my way of writing and you have your way of writing. And these tutorials are always a set of guidelines rather than your letters must look like mine because these are styles that were used throughout many years and used by many people. So it is impossible that these would all look consistent. However, within one person, one person may take a very consistent diversion from what the standard was. This was his and this is yet another clue to prove that this was all written by one person. Why was this written? Ah, uh, we don't know. It may have been a form of penance. Writing texts, writing especially biblical texts, was a very common form of penance and atonement at the time. It could have been written to simply glorify the monastery where it, where it was written, uh, which is ironic because we don't know where it was written. It could have been written because someone was obsessed with knowledge, which is a very realistic option, and wanted to dedicate his life to explore knowledge and make sure that he gives other people the opportunity to explore it. It could have been written as a pact with the devil because you really need it to save your life. We don't know. What you choose to believe is up to you. I can only hope to give you facts, clues, a bit of mystery, and steer you into a centuries-old debate between good and evil and the true reason for this manuscript. Thank you so much for joining me in this first medieval manuscript exploration. I hope you like this kind of video. I'm really excited to make more. I research this stuff for fun, so I might as well share it with you while I'm at it. And we can both get very excited and very motivated to learn more about medieval things. I will see you soon with another video and have a fantastic day. Bye!